Hello folks and welcome back to the second screencast dealing with DNA, proteins, and genetics. In the last video we learned a bit about the role that proteins play in the expression of a genetic trait. That is, proteins are the expression of a gene. We also learned that through a series of historical experiments that DNA is indeed the genetic information that's passed on from cell to cell and not proteins. Proteins are the result of the expression of a gene. So this much we should know, that the gene is the code for a protein, and the protein is the expression of the trait, or it's the phenotype. And we have variations in phenotypes because proteins can vary. But what we don't know yet is how we get from a gene to a protein. How is it that DNA actually codes for the making of a protein? Now DNA is classified as an organic compound known as a nucleic acid. There's one other nucleic acid other than DNA that's also responsible for transferring information from a gene to a protein, and that's DNA's close cousin, RNA. So we'll look at the structure of both of those molecules here in this video. First, let's start with the structure of DNA. DNA, as you know, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and its functions involve storing information, genetic information, it can copy itself, and it can transmit information from one cell to the next. And DNA is a twisted, double-stranded structure known as a double helix. If we take DNA apart, we see that it's actually a polymer, meaning that it's made up of smaller repeating units known as a nucleotide. Now, the basic structure of a nucleotide is this. We have a sugar molecule called deoxyribose. It's a five-carbon sugar. And the carbons in the five carbon sugar pentagon ring here are numbered here. Carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, and carbon number five. Also attached to the nucleotide is this molecule called a phosphate. It happens to have a negative charge. And the sugar and the phosphate are bonded together strongly by a covalent bond. On the first carbon here, is also bonded a nitrogenous base. You can see in the green highlighted portion of this molecule why it might be called a nitrogenous base. Indeed, there's a lot of nitrogen there. We've also learned that there are, in DNA, four different kinds of nitrogenous bases. There's thymine, cytosine, which are single ring carbon structures in a class called pyrimidines. You won't have to know that they're called pyrimidines but you should know that they are single ring structures and that, they and that they're paired up with two other nitrogenous bases, adenine and guanine. Adenine and guanine are double ring structures. And what you see here are at least three nucleotides bonded together in a single strand of, of DNA. This, of course, is not a complete strand of DNA. But you can see here that you've got the five carbon sugar with its nitrogenous base off to one side and the phosphate here. And then that is linked covalently to another sugar molecule and then another phosphate, another sugar, and another phosphate. This part of the molecule right here is considered the backbone of the DNA molecule, sometimes called the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA molecule. Off to one side are the nitrogenous bases. Now, wherever you see a thymine, opposite that will be another nucleotide carrying adenine. These bars right here represent hydrogen bonds, and there's a double hydrogen bond between thymine and adenine. Continuing down on the other side, you'd get another linked, another nitrogenous base linked by a phosphate to guanine if cytosine is on the other side. So thymine bonds with adenine and cytosine with guanine and vice versa. Guanine happens to have a triple hydrogen bond. The number of hydrogen bonds is not important, but you should know that hydrogen bonds hold the nitrogenous bases together in the double strand. And to finish this off, of course, if you have adenine, the complementary nucleotide would be thymine on the other side. Now, as you continue this, you'll get a long strand of, a long double strand of of the DNA molecule that twists upon itself because of the hydrogen bonds that exist on the, on the sugar and phosphate backbone. 
but DNA has the unique ability to copy itself, and there are a number of enzymes that, that help do this. The first enzyme, as you see here, modeled by this purple X structure, is called DNA helicase. The DNA helicase acts to break the bonds between the nitrogenous bases and unwind the DNA molecule. The other molecule, also responsible for helping to copy the two strands that are separated, is called DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase has the responsibility of finding free nucleotides floating around in the cytoplasm and attaching them to the open bonds of the nitrogenous bases that are exposed on what we call the parent strand. What happens is that you get two new daughter strands of DNA that are identical copies of one another. This is what a cell has to do before it goes through mitosis, cell division, or even through meiosis. This is how it copies its DNA. Here's a simpler picture of how it happens. DNA helicase will work to unzip the DNA in two directions, creating what's called a replication bubble. And DNA polymerase will work on both strands. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that works on both strands to replace the missing portions of the DNA on the opposite strands. So you'll end up with two new DNA molecules. And this will occur until it reaches each of end of the DNA molecule, otherwise known as the chromosome. And now for RNA, DNA's helper. Actually, DNA is so precious that it never leaves the nucleus. Because if it did, we'd get a lot of wear and tear and break down very easily. So it's preserved inside the nucleus, nice and safe. It's RNA that actually does all the work of transferring that information out into the cytoplasm where the proteins can actually be made. RNA is also a nucleic acid made up of nucleotides, just like DNA. But there are three differences between DNA and RNA. First of all, there's a different sugar. The, the sugar is also 5-carbon, but it's called ribose. RNA is single-stranded, not double. It does have four nitrogenous bases, but instead of thiamine, it has a uracil, indicated by the symbol capital U instead of T. And it so happens to be that there are three different kinds of RNA. Each of the three different kinds have, have a different job to do. First is messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a long single-stranded copy of a gene. It carries instructions for the polypeptide, the primary structure of the protein, from the nucleus to the ribosome in the cytoplasm. The next type of RNA is called a ribosome. You've heard of ribosomes as an organelle inside of cells. Well, it's really a large molecule. It's got two structures, a large unit and a small unit. And ribosomes are where the amino acids get put together into the polypeptide chain. And then thirdly, we have transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is so-called because it transfers the amino acid from the cytoplasm to the ribosome in order to be attached to the long-growing polypeptide chain. If we get back to what's called the central dogma of genetics, we can add a new dimension. That is, we need to go from the gene, which is DNA, to RNA, and that process is called transcription. The word transcription means to write or to copy. The code from the DNA is copied onto an RNA molecule. And then from the RNA, that code is translated into a protein. First, transcription. It occurs inside the nucleus. So the big purple structure that you see there is a nucleus. And you can see a DNA molecule being unwound by a large enzyme protein called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase actually seeks out a gene on the chromosome and unwinds the DNA there in order to copy the code from the DNA onto the messenger RNA. When it gets to the end of the gene, RNA polymerase stops and the mRNA or the messenger RNA is made. So here's a typical messenger RNA code. It's single-stranded. And if you were to straighten it out, you would notice 
what would appear to be a random sequence of nitrogenous bases here. G for guanine, C for cytosine, U for uracil, and A for adenine. This code is actually read three nitrogen bases at a time. The three nitrogen bases are a unit called a codon. Each three-letter codon corresponds to a particular amino acid. And as, and as the cell reads down the messenger RNA, it knows which amino acid to put in place in the sequence by reading the codon one to the next. And like I said, GCU, one codon, corresponds to a particular amino acid. And we actually know which amino acids each codon codes for. Here's what we call a genetic wheel. The way it works is that when you're given a codon, the first letter, the first letter in the codon is read in the middle here. If you remember, GC, G was the first letter in the first codon that we saw. C was the second codon, and U was the third codon. Read as GCU, that codes for the amino acid alanine. Here's another genetic decoder. It's not in the form of a wheel, but you use it the same way. This is the way this works. It's a little bit more complicated, but the first letter here in the codon is identified as G, so we know we're talking about this row. The second letter was C, so we know we're talking about this group right here. C, come down. And then the third letter, U, represents this code right here, GCU. And here's the abbreviation for alanine, just like we saw on the wheel. So there's just two different decoders for the same code. When we're reading the code like this, what we're doing is called translation. Translation takes place out in the cytoplasm. So the messenger RNA has to leave the nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm to find a ribosome. The ribosome is the ribosome has all the machinery to start reading the code. Every messenger RNA code starts the same way with what's called a start codon, AUG. AUG also corresponds to a particular amino acid called methionine. Now here is where transfer RNA is actually coming in to do its job. Transfer RNA is called transfer RNA, you remember, because it transfers the amino acid to where the proteins are being assembled. Here you see tr three transfer RNAs in a row. The ribosomal RNA will dock two transfer RNAs at a time, and it docks it based on the codon on the messenger RNA. Now the appropriate transfer RNA has a complementary code to a codon on the messenger RNA. The code on the transfer RNA is called an anti-codon. So this is how the match is made by the ribosome. Now when the first two amino acids are bonded together, the first transfer RNA leaves, leaving behind its amino acid. The ribosome moves down the messenger RNA, bringing in the, the appropriate transfer RNA, carrying the amino acids, and bonding them together. And if you can move this along in your, in your mind to see this in action, eventually you get a long chain of amino acids into what's called a polypeptide, or the primary structure of the protein. And at the end of all this activity, you'll have this polypeptide chain that starts to change shape based on some of these interactions between electric charges uh, that occur between amino acids in the long chain. So this is how you start getting your secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary structure before you get your actual functional protein. But what happens if the code is wrong? Well, if the code is wrong, then, you put, then the cell will put the wrong amino acid in the chain, and the appropriate interactions that that shape the molecule might be different. And so what you end up with is a mutation. Mutations start in the DNA, not the RNA, and end up in the protein. So if we go back to some of the codes in DNA, you can see some of the things that typically happen. If this represents a code in a typical DNA molecule, each one of these letters here representing 
a, a codon, sometimes a deletion occurs. That is, part of the DNA code is cut out. There could just be one nucleotide. So that's called a deletion. Sometimes a nitrogenous base can be copied again, and that's called a duplication, or sometimes called an addition. Sometimes nitrogenous bases are flipped, that's called an inversion. All three of these types of mutations can result in what's called a frame shift, so that when the mRNA is copied from this, the sequence of codons is shifted off the normal sequence. So the entire polypeptide will have the wrong sequence of amino acids. One other type of mutation is called a translocation, and that's when the part of one gene is misplaced in the wrong position on the DNA molecule. Now you might think that mutations always have a detrimental effect. In fact, many mutations occur that have no effect on the protein at all. In fact, the protein still folds properly. It's when just the wrong amino acid is put in the wrong place that changes the entire shape of the protein. In that case, you've got a different protein. Now we've talked about mutations being bad. But sometimes mutations lead to a, a protein that works a different way and sometimes better in a different environment. In that case, that mutation leads to a variation that becomes an adaptation to the organism. And an adaptation, as you might know, makes it easier for the organism to live. The main point here is that mutations lead to variations within a population. Without mutation, there wouldn't be any variation, and there wouldn't be any adaptation to changes in the environment. So mutations are very important. Now let's go back to the classroom and do some activities that help us model both transcription, the copying of DNA onto mRNA, and translation, where mRNA, ribosomes, and tRNA put together amino acids in a polypeptide chain. We'll even look at what happens when we change the code and mutate it. I hope that was helpful. We'll see you back in class.